British designed 22,000 pound bombs, the largest aerial missiles in existence. Known as the Grand Slam or Volcano, the 11 tonner measures 25 feet 5 inches in length and more than 3 feet in diameter. It's fastened under the fuselage of a specially modified Lancaster. The bombs first saw combat use last March in attacks on the viaducts forming part of the railway system serving the Ruhr. Viaducts normally are most difficult targets to strike from the air. The 11 tonners are employed on this raid to determine whether aiming difficulties can be overcome by increasing both the explosive content and effective blast area. The angle setting of the fins causes the big bomb to spin when falling, adding to stability and accuracy. separate attacks were made on the viaducts. Damage is surveyed from the air and the ground. A lake caused by the bomb crater. Even without a direct hit, a near miss is enough to demolish substantial structures by the 11-ton bomb's terrific blast effect. Arrival at Oslo by C-47s of the American 474th Infantry Regiment. They've been flown in from England to assist British occupation forces in the evacuation of approximately a quarter million German troops. Brigadier General Owen D. Summers is in command of the Oslo Military Zone. LSTs bring in other elements of the 474th. This regiment includes the 96th Battalion, a contingent of Norwegian Americans, most of whom speak the language and who were trained originally for an invasion of Norway. King Haakon returns to Norway on 7th June, the 5th anniversary of his departure for Great Britain and the 40th anniversary of Norwegian independence. Allied Army and Navy officers participate in the welcoming ceremonies. American troops march in the parade. Men of the 474th Regiment line up for inspection by the monarch. With King Haakon's return, a new Norwegian government will be formed. Before his triumphal return to the United States, General Dwight D. Eisenhower receives a welcome from hundreds of thousands of Parisians. He drives through the French capital on 14th June, five years to the day after German troops had done the same. Greeted by General Charles de Gaulle, the Supreme Allied Commander next lays a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier at the Arc de Triomphe. General de Gaulle decorates General Eisenhower with the Cross of Liberation, the highest honor that France can bestow. Seagoing maintenance units have been designed by ordnance to retrieve and service battle-worn LVTs. Shown here is a beachhead repair shop. All equipment is mounted on skid trays, approximately 12 by 6 and a half feet, which are securely emplaced aboard several LVTs. Moving into a section providing the best natural cover, the skids are unloaded by leading a cable from the rear end of the skid to a suitable anchorage. Then the LVT can be driven out from beneath the skid. Five skids comprise the seagoing shop. Adequately spaced for efficient operation, this maintenance organization will repair and service LVTs until a permanent outfit can take over. The five sections are as follows. A spare part skid, a unit repair skid containing a generator, a bearing puller, power tools, vices, and workbenches, an engine repair skid, a welding and blacksmithing skid including power hacksaw and battery charger, 
Finally, there's a unit which provides consumable items, such as acetylene for welding, sheet metal, and so on. The retriever serves the same general purpose in this outfit as a heavy wrecker in an ordnance medium maintenance company. Here, its pumping unit, which can deliver 500 gallons per minute, goes into action against the burning LVT. The pump's 120-pound pressure permits effective firefighting from a safe distance. For engine, gasoline, or oil fires, a 10-foot fog nozzle applicator can be used. The fine fog spray chokes off the oxygen and extinguishes the blaze. When the fire is out, the LVT is towed ashore for repair in the shop area. An LVT swamped in the surf is pulled out using the winch mounted on the retriever. The winch has 300 feet of three-quarter inch wire rope which will safely stand the strain of 38,000 pounds. A broken support roller bracket on an LVT is another job for the retriever. It carries an arc welding outfit for making spot repairs. When parts are required, they are secured from the consumable skid at the repair shop. After completing its beachhead mission, the maintenance outfit may be reloaded on LVTs and returned for reassignment. Wire is loaded on a C-47 in preparation for a wire laying demonstration over terrain too difficult for normal ground wire laying. The wire is previously wound in a twist fork pattern so that it pays out from the inside of the coil. The outside end of one coil is spliced to the inside end of the next coil to permit a continuous run. A pressure tank forces a soap solution through rubber tubes to lubricate the wire and reduce friction when it's paid out. Only modification of the C-47 is the removal of the rear door panel. Smoke signals mark the beginning and end of the laying run. A chain attached to a small chute carries the wire to the ground. As soon as the signal crew has secured the wire, connection is established with the company switchboard. The wire is laid at the rate of a mile every 30 seconds. An unmodified C-47 can lay as much as 16 miles of wire at a single run. pilot flies directly over the smoke signal marking the end of the run. Contact with advance units is established as soon as the signal crew can reach the wire and connect it to the field phone. Films of American transports flying troops of the Chinese 6th Army Group to Jigyang, China, where the U.S. 14th Air Force base is threatened by an advancing Japanese column. The troops, after fighting in Burma, are returned to halt the new Japanese drive in China. Much equipment is brought in with the Chinese troops. The soldiers are taken to the front in trucks driven by Americans. Mules are also flown in from the Burma front. Weapons, ammunition, and food are supplied by American liaison groups cooperating with the Chinese. American air bases east of Jigyang are evacuated. While Chinese troops are being rushed through Jigyang to turn back the enemy drive, all supplies at these smaller air bases, including thousands of gallons of gasoline, are safely removed to Jigyang by all available transport.
Huge gasoline drums weighing about 365 pounds are carried to waiting evacuation planes by the Chinese coolies. The heavy drums are loaded onto the planes by the coolies who willingly perform the back-breaking work of hastily removing supplies from the threatened area. Many large transport planes are so deeply mired in the mud of the landing strip that they can't be flown out from one threatened base. Chinese coolies pull these planes out of the mud through sheer strength of numbers, since all mechanical equipment had previously been removed from the field to prevent it from falling into the hands of the enemy. While evacuation operations at these air bases are being carried out, C-47s fly supplies and ammunition to the airfield at Zhuizhuan, a Chinese city recaptured from the Japanese. Airdrops supply the Chinese troops fighting behind the western Japanese lines. Counterattacks along the entire Hunan province front are preludes to a general Chinese counteroffensive in this sector, capitalizing on the current Japanese withdrawal. Chinese soldiers wounded in the frontline fighting are returned to base hospitals in American trucks. Trucks form an important part of the combined plane, vehicle, and horse transportation system furnished by Americans to carry Chinese 6th Army troops and supplies to the front. The wounded are transported to the Chinese hospital at Guiyang. Chinese troops smashed the Jap drive on the American air base at Jigyang, 9th May, in one of the most important victories of the Chinese war. <music> Training paratroopers at a school in the Pacific Theater. At Lipai Airstrip, Batangas, Luzon, troops attend the 11th Airborne Division's Parachute Jump School. An instructor demonstrates the parts and opening sequence of a parachute. At the jump tower, the students take the first steps in learning the parachute drop. Teaching at the school covers every phase of parachute jumping, from instruction in the operation of the chute to the completed jump from a plane. Jumping from a mock plane. The simulated aircraft doorway is approximately the size and position of the opening in an actual plane. After completion of ground training, the students file into a waiting C-46 for the initial parachute drop. Inside the plane, the men wait the go signal. 24 students make their first parachute drop. In the mass jump from the C-46, all men descend safely to the jump field. Training installations in the Philippines are increasing as South Pacific units move north from earlier bases in Australia. Troops of an assault signal company practice amphibious landings in Hawaii as they train for further combat duty. In Europe, this signal company already has experienced the difficulties of a major landing on an enemy coast and is now headed for similar action in the Pacific. assault boats hit the shore. In its European invasion, this unit not only completed its mission of furnishing signal communications for the initial amphibious landing, but maintained open wire and pole communications in the area for months afterward. The beach training problem covers setting up of wire, radio, and message center communications. One man carries the reeled out field wire into the underbrush for an advanced field telephone. Other troops quickly set up the field switchboard and the wire is attached to the board. In a short time, the switchboard is in operation. The LCVPs bring more signal troops to the shore. Troops come up on the beach with drums of field wire and radio equipment. They quickly spread out over the area. The radio team sets up its equipment as the men dig in to establish the radio post. Sending messages by field radio. The training stresses the importance of maintaining uninterrupted communications during complex landing operations involving air, naval, and ground units. A company message center. 
After the successful completion of the training mission, the troops are addressed by a company officer. Okay, man, that was a fine operation. Just one point I want to bring out. You got to remember that these beaches in this theater are just like the beaches you landed on in Normandy. They'll be zeroed and registered in beforehand by the enemy's artillery and automatic weapons. When you hit them, you got to get them across them fast and keep on going. Road conditions near the 96th Division's front lines on Okinawa. A week of heavy rain slows down the transport of personnel and supplies. On a road up near the front, vehicles sliding off the road because of the mud have to be abandoned. Trucks stalled on Route 5, an important supply line of the 77th Division front. A number of bulldozers are used to pull trains of trucks through the deepest stretches of mud, while others are kept busy dragging out stalled vehicles. Ammunition for the front bogs down along another of the supply roads. Along some sectors, supplies are moved only by tracked vehicles, and even these have difficulty with the mud. On June 7th, the roads leading up to the fronts in and about Shuri and Naha are impassable during most of the day. Personnel and equipment moving to new positions are at a standstill. Blocked by muddy roads outside Cuba, supplies, equipment and personnel are loaded on various landing craft at Cuba Beach for transporting to Yonabaru. The seven-mile journey by water down the east coast of Okinawa helps to ease the supply situation. A P-38 covering the substitute supply line. At Yonabaru, the needed supplies are rushed from the boats to the nearby front lines over passable roads. The improvised supply line services frontline troops of the 7th and 96th Divisions, as well as the 7th Field Depot. On their return trips, the naval craft are used to evacuate wounded to the 69th and 74th Field Hospitals, located near Cuba. Japanese prisoners of war and civilians from the destroyed towns and villages in the vicinity are also evacuated on the boats returning to Cuba Beach for additional supplies. The F-7F, known as the Tiger Cat, a new twin-engine fighter bomber. Powered by double WASP engines, the F-7F qualifies at its critical altitude for the 425 mile an hour class. The plane carries 4,000 pounds of bombs or a full-sized marine torpedo or rockets. For extra range, it has a 300 gallon drop tank in addition to its regular gas supply. First production of the F-7F goes to the Marine Corps, which will use them to clean up enemy strong points ahead of advancing ground troops. Later, the Navy will get them. The Tiger Cat is equipped with a tricycle landing gear. The fighter bus can be handled by the new 45,000 ton carriers of the Midway class. 